I'm Roxanne Camilleri, and I'm the director here at the Clifton Arts Center, and we are continuing our webinar series features. We're delighted to welcome three members of the American Sewing Guild North Jersey chapter, Sarah Nunziata, who is president of the chapter, and Laura Adler and Anne-Marie Soto, who both serve on the chapter's board. Today's webinar presentation is Fabrics, Fact and Fiction and we will learn about fabrics. I encourage our audience to type any questions and comments in our chat box, and after the presentation, we will do our best to answer them. Without further ado, I introduce you to our panelists, Anne-Marie Soto, Sarah Nunziata, and Laura Adler. Greetings all, we're delighted to be here um, and to this webinar with the Clifton Arts Center. We wanted to give you a short introduction about who the North Jersey chapter of the American Sewing Guild is. We are a chapter that is part of a national organization called the American Sewing Guild, which has chapters all over the country. Our mission is to advance sewing as an art and a life skill. And as members, we welcome all levels of sewers, beginning sewers, wannabe sewers, experienced sewers. If you're interested in learning about sewing, we're the place to find out. We're delighted that we've had a lovely relationship with the Clifton Arts Center. Some of you may be familiar with us. We did a exhibit called Craft and Comfort in November, 2019. And if you missed it, there are links both on the Clifton uh, website, the Arts Center website and our website so that you can learn a little bit more about that wonderful exhibit. We offer workshops and seminars for our members. We cover a whole range of topics, um, fitting, quilting, we made mug rugs, we've learned about heirloom sewing, and it's a wonderful way to get together and share knowledge and information. Like most organizations, when the pandemic started, we pivoted to doing things on Zoom. Uh, we kicked off our Zoom experience with a backstage tour of the San Francisco Opera Company, uh, their costume department, which was really fun. And you can see that video on our website. Also, we did a webinar on upcycling and altering your jeans and pants. And then our most recent webinar was actually a sew along, which is an introduction to modern American bojaji boja piecework, which is a typical Korean uh, handicraft. We also instituted a program called the Sew, and that's monthly on Zoom. Um, we usually have three segments, two of which are presented by our members, and the third one is by one of our retail supporters, and that lasts about an hour, and then we have an after party that people are welcome to stay on and chat about. We're going to continue this even when the pandemic is over, uh, because it's been just a wonderful way to reach people who might be a little too far to drive to events or just don't like doing that. Um, like, uh, we also have an active neighborhood group program. Uh, most of them have been on a bit of hiatus during the pandemic, but the Clifton Clippers group, which meets at the barn, is we meeting. They will start in April, and those dates will be on our website. We've also instituted a beginner's garment group on Zoom. Uh, anyone is interested in learning to sew is welcome to join. And then we do a great deal of charity sewing. <clears throat> we've done fleece hats for the homeless. We've done Ryan's cases for smiles. We did kit bags for days for girls. And our 2022 charity sewing is gowns for Operation Smile. And that's really under the guidance of the Clifton Clippers neighborhood group. We invite you to come and learn more about us. Our website is asgnorthjersey.org. And we're also on Facebook, so you're welcome to follow us. Okay, thank you, Roxanne, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to Fabrics, Fact and Fiction from the American Sewing Guild, North Jersey chapter. I'm going to be speaking to you about cotton fabrics. Cotton is my favorite, and cotton is the most important textile in the world. It is grown in over 80 different countries, mostly in the United States, China, and India. Um, it's worn by every class of people in almost every nation. It's durable, it breathes well, and it has a wide range of uses. 
So there are a lot of cottons, but I only picked out about nine of them that I'm gonna talk about right now. So let's begin with our first cotton, canvas. Okay, canvas is also called duck cloth. It's heavy, strong, and durable. It's used for tote bags, art canvases, tents, backpacks, awnings, upholstery, and shoes. The term duck cloth comes from the Dutch word duck. I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but it could be doke or duck, which means linen canvas. If you are sewing with canvas, use a denim, a jeans or a denim needle size 16 or 18. Canvas can be washed or dry cleaned. If you wash it, use a normal tumble dry setting. The canvas fabric will soften and shrink. Use a fabric protector spray on your canvas to help it repel water and keep it cleaner. Corduroy. Corduroy is another one of my favorite fabrics. It is durable. It's a durable ribbed fabric with parallel lengthwise raised cords. The cords are created by adding looped yarns in the weave. The looped yarns are then cut, exposing the pile or the nap. These lengthwise cords are called whales. The use of corduroy depends on the width of the whale. If the corduroy whale is narrow, the fabric will be softer and less durable. Small whales are called pin whales, or sometimes it's called baby cord. And these are used for children's wear for shirts, for caps, for dresses and skirts. If the whale is wider, the fabric will be stronger and it will work well for upholstery and pants. If you are sewing with corduroy, make sure that you follow a with nap pattern layout. Make sure that all your pattern pieces are going in the same direction. Also, you wanna decide before you lay your pattern pieces on the corduroy fabric, do you want the smoothness to go up or down? Because you know how when you feel corduroy, you know, you, you can feel it like down or feel it up. So you decide in the beginning if you want the smoothness up or down, and then you lay your pattern pieces. And you should look at your fabric also. Look at your fabric um, both ways, because you might notice that one way is lighter and the other way is darker. So turn the fabric around to see, maybe you want a certain color, maybe you want it lighter. So put your pattern pieces in that direction. If you decide you want the lighter or darker color, just make sure that all your pattern pieces are going in the same direction so you get the look you want. And you can machine wash and normal tumble dry your corduroy fabric, but it might shrink. If you are going to sew with corduroy, I suggest washing and drying it first, allowing the fabric to shrink before you start working with it. You can iron corduroy with a medium to high steam heat. Put a towel underneath the fabric and press the wrong side. Denim. Denim is a dense twill woven fabric, which means it has diagonal parallel ribs. Because of the way it is woven, denim has a darker front or outside and a lighter colored inside or wrong side. If you are wearing jeans now, take a look at the inside and you'll see what I'm saying. Denim originated as blue jeans, but now it's available in many colors. It can also have different washes like stone washed or acid washed, giving the denim a different look on the outside. Denim comes in different weights and different fiber blends. For example, you can buy a stretch denim with spandex. If you are choosing fabric for a sewing project, read the information on the bolt. It will tell you the weight in ounces and you can feel the denim. It has the, you know, to see if it has the right amount of weight for your project because denim could be lightweight or it could be heavyweight. Lightweight denim is used for children's clothing, shirts, dresses, skirts and crafts. Heavyweight denim is used for pants, shorts, skirts, and jackets. Also like corduroy, denim will shrink in the wash. If you are sewing with denim, I suggest serging 
or zigzagging the cut edges of the fabric before you wash it. This will prevent fraying. I recommend washing the denim fabric by itself or with other similar colors because the color will bleed out. If you're sewing with denim, use a size 14 or 16 needle, depending on the weight of the denim fabric. You can iron your denim with medium to high steam heat. Eyelet. Eyelet is a lightweight feminine cotton fabric featuring holes or cut out pieces surrounded by thread. Many times there is embroidery stitches on the fabric too. You may have to line your eyelet fabric because of the holes and the fabric could be see-through because it's so lightweight. Eyelet is used for summer dresses, skirts, blouses, and baby clothing. Eyelet can also be used in home decor for shower and window curtains. If you are sewing with eyelet, use a size 12 sewing machine needle. Also, when you are in the fabric store choosing your eyelet, you may notice that many of them have one finished edge, edge, usually a scalloped edge. This is a border print. This is very compatible with a pattern that calls for a border print. If you use the finished edge for your hemline, that is the ideal situation. You don't have to sew a hem, it's already done and it's very pretty. You can machine wash and normal tumble dry or air dry your eyelet fabric. Read the label. Sometimes eyelet is a cotton polyester blend. If it's 100% cotton, there may be moderate shrinkage. Okay, flannel. Flannel, most likely this is your pajama fabric in the fall and winter. It has a durable brush nap and a tight plain weave, making it comfortable and durable. Besides sleepwear, flannel is used for bed sheets, bathrobe, shirts, baby receiving blankets, and even quilt batting. Because it is lightweight yet warm, it is great for winter projects. Flannel is very popular for plaid printed shirts for outdoor people. When you buy ready to wear flannel pajamas, most likely the fabric is chemically treated to reduce its flammability but the flannel in the fabric store might not be treated. Usually there are signs hanging up in the store regarding this, or the fabric bolt might be labeled as such, but if not, you can ask a salesperson to help you. If you are planning to sew with flannel, I recommend zigzagging, overlocking, or surging the cut edges of the fabric so it doesn't fray when you wash and dry it, and the flannel will shrink. Use a size 12 sewing machine needle. Use a medium heat iron and steam if needed. Now, sometimes people confuse flannel with fleece because I've heard people say they have fleece pajamas. And I'm like, wait, do you mean flannel? Because they're different. Fleece is usually 100% polyester. It doesn't fray and it could be difficult to sew because it's so bulky. All right, so now we go on to gingham. Gingham is a classic patterned fabric. It looks like a checkerboard because of the intersecting stripes. Gingham is very popular as tablecloths, napkins, curtains, and pillows. In the summer, gingham is used for children's clothing, dresses, shirts, blouses, and more. A quality gingham is woven with cotton and has reversible sides. Gingham is also made from a cotton polyester blend or a nylon blend. These blends cost less money and are not as high quality as the 100% cotton. Gingham checks, they could be small, they could be medium or large, and some come in multiple colors. Madras. Madras is another classic pattern fabric. It is lightweight, colorful fabric with unmatched squares sewn together. It's typically 100% cotton and it shrinks easily. It is most popular in red and orange colors, but it sometimes comes in other colors too. It is bright, fun, and often used for summer clothing like shorts, dresses, and skirts. It can also be used for summer bags. This patchwork fabric originated in India and it was discovered by the Dutch traders in the early 1600s. 
Sears offered the first Madra shirt for sale to the American consumer in its catalog in 1897. Quilting cottons. These have a plain weave, they are a light to medium weight fabric, and they are used to make quilts, of course. They can be used for clothing, but they aren't as soft, they don't drape as well as other cottons. Because quilting cottons are stiffer than other cottons, they can be used for tote bags, handbags, makeup cases, pencil cases, etc. Quilting cottons will shrink, so you might want to wash them before sewing. When designers make new lines of quilting fabrics, they also make about six to 10 design variations, which can be used as coordinating fat quarters. So for the non-quilters, I'll tell you, fat quarter is a piece of fabric that's like 18 inches by 22 inches. And also, if you're going to sew with quilt and cottons, use sewing machine needle size 10 or 12. And this is an excellent fabric for beginner sewers. Okay, sear sucker. This is our last cotton that I'm going to feature here. And this is another classic summertime fabric. It has a lightweight feel and a bumpy look to it. Seersucker is usually striped, checked, or plaid, and it has a wrinkled look. It's great for traveling because it doesn't need ironing. And ironing won't work because when I was younger, I tried. <laughs> I was confused. I was like, is this supposed to be wrinkly? But I tried ironing it and it, it does not come out. It's there permanently. It is very popular for men's suits, summer dresses, skirts, blouses, shirts, and shorts. Seersucker can be machine washed and tumbled dry with moderate shrinking. And to make this fabric, loops of yarns are bunched together to form a puckering effect. These puckers create air pockets between your body and the fabric, keeping the wearer cool in the hot summer. And if you're sewing with seersucker, use a machine needle size 10 or 12. That's it. Thank you. Hi, hey everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to be speaking to you today about three fabrics. Okay. The first of these is wool. So here are some facts about wool. All wool comes from animals. Uh, these are just a few of the animals that it comes from. It does not harm the animal to take the wool. You could think of it as going for a haircut okay? um, or getting a buzz cut. It grows back. Okay? Wool is a protein, not unlike the structure of your own hair. And there are many variations in wool. And so wool can go from extremely lightweight and drapey to the heaviest of winter coats. It can be rough or smooth. And some, what determines some of this are the animals in which it comes from, the way in which it's woven and the weight of the yarn used in the actual weaving process. Uh, wool is a good fabric if you wanna do things with two sides, patterns and prints are almost always woven in as part of the fabric. Okay? That means that if you look at the right side of the fabric and the wrong side, it will be very similar, although there may be some color variations. Okay? So here's just a few examples. The skirt on the left, you can see, is very fluid and drapey, while the men's suit is very structured. Okay. Here are two examples of coats. The, the black one is a heavy wool winter melton coat, and the gray one is actually an alpaca. And if I zoom into that, you could see that the little tiny hairs, just like you would see on the animal. Okay. And that becomes part of the weaving process. So wool is an excellent insulator. You could think of it like a honeycomb shade that you would hang on a drafty window. It traps the air inside the fibers of the wool and keeps it from getting close to your body. It can absorb some water if you get stuck in a drizzle or a light rain and without it losing its insulating properties. Okay? Today, wool is even being used as blown in insulation in the walls because it's both a sound barrier and fire retardant. Okay? If you're sewing, wool is a very forgiving fabric. Okay? It is stable to sew on, 
unless it's a very lightweight wool that might stretch, but most of the time it's stable and it's easy to pull out your stitches without them showing. Um, unless of course you happen to be sewing black on black, then it's very hard to find those threads. So some people I know use dark gray to make their stitches more visible if they have to rip. Um, it molds and presses like no other fabric. And I'm gonna talk about more about that in a minute. It also shrinks. So if you are sewing at home and you want to use wool and you so desire to wash it, you would have to wash and dry it first or really steam it very well in order to shrink it up before you use it. You have to follow the care label on a garment that you've purchased. The reason for that is every garment has structure built inside. And while a home sewer may be able to wash and dry their wool in preparation for sewing with it, you don't really know how the manufacturer has treated that fabric. You also don't know what built the structure into that garment. And therefore, you have to follow the care label very carefully. In these hats, this is what I was talking about, wool molding. These hats are all shaped by steaming and heat. And once shaped like this, that shape is there to stay. A couple of myths about wool are that wool is only a winter fabric, which is not true. Wool comes in a very lightweight version. Think of men's um, summer suits, right? It, also that it cannot be washed, we talked about that, and that it itches. Now I'm a person who itches from wool, so I know that it does itch some people, but I have also met many people who say it doesn't bother them. Also, if you do find yourself sensitive to wool, you should try other kinds of wool or wool blended with other fabrics. So cashmere may be blended with silk, will not itch, whereas a pure wool melton might itch. So now we're going to talk a little bit about silk. Silk is probably my favorite fabric. I just love the luxuriousness of it, the feel of it, the way in which it takes dyes and can be manipulated. Okay? Most people, when they think of silk, think of examples like this. It's shiny, it's soft to the touch, and very drapey. Okay? However, just like wool, silk can come in a variety of textures and types. It also depends on the weaving, how many threads per inch get put into the, into the silk. Okay. It's a pro protein very much like your hair and takes dye extremely well. It ranges in weight from very, very lightweight and see-through to stiff and structured like you would use in a jacket. Um, the weight of silk is described in something called mummies. Okay. Um, basically, this can be translated to the number of grams of fabric in a square meter. The lower the number of the mummies, the lighter weight the fabric. It goes for home sewing anywhere from about eight mummies to about 30 mummies. It is biodegradable and will biodegrade in one to four years. So these are some examples of silk. Um, this is a very lightweight silk, probably about an eight mummy, whereas this one's probably about a 24. This is something called silk dupioni. So silk is a fabulous insulating fabric in every season. In the wintertime, people wear silk long johns. I wear silk liners in my gloves to keep my hands warm. In the summertime, it's very cool and comfortable. It is hypoallergenic. I have never met anyone who complained about the feel of silk. Okay? Our most common source of silk is the domestic silkworm. However, silk can also come from beetles, honeybees, and arachnids. And it's been around a very long time. So if you are a sewer, it takes a lot of practice to get it right, but you can do it with the correct techniques. It is great to travel with. When I'm traveling, I make all of my t-shirts out of silk because I wash and dry them, dry the fabric first, and then whatever garment I make is washable. It is a very fast drying fabric. So when I get to the hotel room in the evening, I can wash it out, hang it up. It's good to go in a few hours. However, if you have purchased 
a silk garment, you really must follow the care label. Again, because you don't know how they treated the fabric before they made the garment, and you don't know what's in the structure of the garment. So here are three examples of garments that can be washed. Okay, I wash all of these. This one um, was store-bought, but I still washed it. It did come with a washable label in it. And these I would never wash because they have too much structure. This top left one is actually a sweater knit. It's a combination of silk and cotton. It's a very heavy, beautiful weight. And I would not want this to be twisted out of shape in the washing machine. So here are some myths about silk. Everything that says silk is silk, which is not necessarily true. When you buy something from the store and it has a label in it, it says 100% silk, you can believe it. But fabric sewers will know that they'll go to a fabric store and something may be advertised as silk satin. That they are talking about a name of a fabric and not necessarily the content. So make sure you read the bolt labels and check the price. The more expensive it is, the better your chance that it is silk. Another myth is that silk is fragile. This is not true. Silk retains its strength and structure even after it gets wet. Okay? We talked about the washing if you're making it from scratch. The other myth is that it's sticky in summertime. This is also not true. Silk is a very cool and comfortable fabric in the summer. Okay. So these fabrics are rayons. Okay? Um, rayon has come a long way since it was first introduced. Um, the fabrics here, this is just fabric and not a garment. This one is a scarf. These are fabrics. I draped them side by side to show you that the red one is a woven fabric and the blue one is actually a knit. Okay. So here are some facts about rayon. They do, it does start with some kind of natural product. It could be bamboo, it could be tree pulp, okay? They are natural fibers that get heavily, heavily processed with chemicals. Okay? There are other no names for rayons. Some of these you could see here like lyocell and tencel. And it, it's an amazing fabric because it can be made to mimic other fibers. So it could look like silk, it could look like wool, it could look like a sweater knit. Okay? Um, it's absorbent and soft and easy to dye and takes colors beautifully. Um, people who embroider, uh, especially by machine, often use a rayon fiber or a rayon thread because it's so beautifully dyed. Okay? However, it's not as strong as silk, and you should not machine wash it, um, unless the label says that you can, because today they often blend rayon with other fabrics that give it a little more strength. But rayon on its own weakens when wet and loses a lot of its um, qualities. Okay? 50 years ago, if you took a rayon blouse and put it into the washing machine, you would probably get something out that looked barely big enough to fit a doll. Okay. So here's the myth about rayon and it's really one big myth and that is that it's good for the environment because it starts with natural resources. This is true, it comes from wood pulp, bamboo, other plant fibers. However, it is so heavily chemical in its production that workers actually get injured in the making because of the chemical exposure. There are some types of rayon that cannot be manufactured in the United States because it doesn't meet EPA standards. Um, one of these is the most, a very famous rayon called Bemberg rayon, which is used for linings in garments. Okay? And while rayon is biodegradable and it quickly biodegrades in about three to four weeks, while the fabric biodegrades, it leaches the chemicals into the air and the water. Also, the harvesting of the wood pulp destroys the trees, so it's not really sustainable. Um, if you do want to buy a rayon garment, you might want to look for these two names, Modal and Lyocell. They use something called a closed loop manufacturing process, which reuses the chemicals and the water. Um, thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions in the chat box.
Our first two segments concentrated mostly on natural fibers, things that were plant-based or animal-based with the exception of rayon. So I'm gonna talk about, at the beginning of this segment, two of the ubiquitous uh, fibers that you'll find, and that's acrylic and polyester. These are both mineral-based. Acrylic is a man-made polymer from fibers created from fossil fuels. It closely resembles the look and feel of wool, and it's frequently blended with wool fibers for improved performance. Has a lot of pros. Um, it's lightweight and warm. It dries quickly. It's soft to the touch. It's water repellent, and it's inexpensive compared to wool. If you look at the flame stitch fabric um, that's in a sweater here, that retails the fabric by the yard retails for about seven dollars a yard. If that were 100% wool, it would be well, probably two to three times as expensive. It's also uh, acrylic fi fabrics are used often in home deck and upholstery, outdoor fabrics. The fact that they are very water repellent makes them great for outdoor things. But they also have some cons. Um, that same water repellent properties can also create bacteria growth. So you have to make sure that things are air dried well uh, before you keep them around. It's also prone to static electricity and cling. If you've ever taken a sweater out of the dryer, it's got acrylic in it. You know you have to shake it and it'll crackle and make all these noises so you get rid of the electricity. It has a tendency to pill, which makes it um, not particularly the most wearable of fabrics, durable. And it's flammable and it can take up to 200 years to decompose. Think about that as opposed to what Lara said about silk, which can take just a couple of years. Polyester has come a long way from the uh, leisure wear suit of the 70s, and it is actually the most commonly used fiber in clothing. It too is a product, product of a chemical reaction between coal, petroleum, air, and water. And it's responsible for the consumption of nearly 70 million barrels of oil per year. You might think about that as we're talking about the increased costs for fossil fuels these days. It has some pros. It's very stain resistant. It's extremely wrinkle resistant. It's easy to maintain. Uh, the fibers are actually heat sensitive. So things like pleats and other details can be permanently set. If you take a close look at that sort of gray fabric at the bottom, um, that has an embossed texture and that's permanently set. Doesn't matter what you hit it with the iron, that those little textures will stay in. And it's frequently used as a blend with cotton. It adds strength, it adds wrinkle resistance, and it reduces shrinkage. Cons, it's derived from re non-renewable resources. It too, like acrylic, can take up to 200 years to decompose. It also, when you wash it, it sheds minuscule pieces of plastic with every wash. That might not seem too significant, but think about the fact that our water ends up back in the environment. So this is not really good for our marine life. But now we've got a couple of fabrics we wanted to introduce you to, a couple of fibers just for fun. First one is hemp. Hemp fiber is obtained from the stem of the plant. Uh, it's called bast fibers. And hemp was once considered too rough to comfortably wear, but producers have discovered a process which uses enzymes that removes the fiber's roughness while still allowing it to retain its durability. It's interesting to note it's been a long, around a very long time First uh, trousers made for Levi were hemp trousers and they were made for miners. And fiber grown hemp is much less intensive than the CBD hemp, but it has limiting processing plants in the US. So most of the hemp fibers are generated from other parts of the world. It's extremely friendly to uh, the environment and it's good for sustainability. It captures, when you grow hemp, it captures very large quantities of carbon, 
It's a relatively drought tolerant plant and it can usually withstand frost. It's fast growing and it resists pests and it can even heal the soil by restoring vital nutrients. And on the very same amount of land, hemp can produce 2.5 times more fiber than cotton and six times more fiber than flax. It has a lot of pros. It absorbs dyes very well, so the colors are beautiful. It's hypoallergenic. It's resistant to ultraviolet light and mold. It's naturally resistant to bacteria. It's cool in summer. It's warm in winter. So you'll find hemp often used in active wear, and it's often blended with cotton, linen, silk, or wool for greater softness and increased durability. Cons, tends to wrinkle easily. If you look at that gentleman in his nice blue shirt, he's really a bit of a wrinkled mess. So if that's not a look you like, you're gonna probably stay away from 100% hemp fabrics. And because it is um, very limited availability, so you're not going to find a lot of examples. Now this one, um, bananas can be used for fabric. Bananas are, uh, fabric is made by stripping apart the sheaths of the avocado banana stem and processing these fibers into yarns. <clears throat> the banana fabric is very delicate and has a silk-like texture. It's incredibly strong. It's resistant to the effects of salt water and it's biodegradable. But it's cons, it's expensive and it's hard to find. Um, the sweater that's here made out of, knitted out of banana fibers is from an Etsy shop. And the beautiful fuchsia dress is from a company named Volani, which is owned by two women out of Chicago. And they do exclusively garments out of banana fibers. Then one of the newest things on the market, or will be soon on the market, is called mushroom leather. Um, mycelium is the root-like part of the mushrooms, and it's used to create dense layers of a material that looks, feels, and bends like leather made from cows. It's soft, durable, and it's naturally waterproof. It accepts dye well, it's lightweight and flexible, and it's 100% biodegradable. It has some cons. It's very expensive to produce, and the production right now is extremely limited. It can actually take up to two months to grow a cow-sized piece of mushroom leather. So you're not gonna find it um, real available right now. The handbag and the shoes here uh, are prototypes and the one up on the top, the Victorian travel bag, is a bag under, it's a prototype that Hermes is going to put out and that bag um, will retail for a cool $7,000. So we're not gonna find this right now. Um, too available, but it's something to keep your eye on because it has a lot of benefits. So we'd like to just sum up by saying when you're looking at, at fabric, whether it's a, something you're buying in a ready-made garment or something upholstery or even the fabric, there's some things to think about. One is price, how much you're willing to invest. As we talked about it, a wool with an acrylic in it um, is it going to be a whole lot cheaper than a 100% wool, but you also have to think about longevity. Uh, if you're not inter interested in fast fashion, you want to go for the uh, natural fibers and, you know, look, look at the silks, look at the woolens, um, look at the linens, which we really didn't discuss today, but um, they, they will give you a durability and a, and a long life in your wardrobe. Also, think about sustainability. That may be important to you. It's becoming more important um, as our earth becomes more fragile. And then think about care. Read the labels that will tell you a lot about whether you want to put this item in your closet. Um, you can dry clean. I have used personally the um, dry cleaning, uh, the home dry cleaning things that you put in the dryer. They can work very well, but they have limitations. They're not for heavily uh, soiled garments. There also is a chemical smell, so you need to take it out. You should take it out immediately so you don't have to worry about pressing it and hang it out someplace that's well ventilated to let it dry. Or do you want to machine wash it? Do you want to go through the bother of hand washing? Um, if you take a look at the little label up in the corner there, that's a 50% poly, 85% cotton, but it's a do not bleach, do not iron, and do not tumble, tumble dry. So if you're going to purchase something like that, that's a lot of don'ts to remember. And finally, we'd like to suggest a couple of 
resources that you might take a look at if you want to learn a little bit more about fabric. There are lots of really good books. We, we picked three of our, I guess they're our favorites. The Fabric A to Z is an essential guide for choosing and using fabric for sewing. All New Fabric Savvy also covers the same thing. And then Linen and Cotton. And even if you're not a sewer, you may find these books very handy to have because they have pictures of the fabrics. And sometimes if you're trying to buy things, particularly online, um, they will call, describe the fabric as something and you really need to hook it up <laughs> in one of these books or on the internet and find out if what they're calling it is really what you're getting. So you're not disappointed. So we would like to thank you for listening to us talk about one of our favorite topics, which is fabrics. And we encourage you to visit us at uh, asgnorthjerseychapter.org to learn more about us and maybe just become part of our organization. Thank you. Thank you again, Anne-Marie and Laura and Sarah uh, for showing us all about fabrics. I hope now we probably all have a better understanding and appreciation about fabrics. Um, I do hope that everyone has had a chance, or if you have not had a chance, you're welcome to put down any questions or comments on our chat box and we'll be happy to answer them. But I'm going to um, bring the floor again back to Anne-Marie and if, if you have any comments that you'd like to address to the audience. Well, I think um, someone did ask uh, about cleaning for costumes. So maybe we could address that. Um, one of the things that's fun about belonging to ASG is we have a national conference every year and it moves in different places around the country. And a couple of years ago, we were in Houston and we got to go for a backstage tour of the Houston Ballet Company and learned a whole lot about how they take care of their costumes. <clears throat> and interestingly, when they make something, everything except the wool fabrics are washed before they make the costumes, um, no matter how fragile or how how whatever it is, um, which I found interesting because I have a friend who does a lot of sort of artistic sewing and she washes everything before she does it too. She does a lot of beading. And she says, if it goes in, in the wash machine, a pig and it comes out a cow, it's still fabric and you can still do something with it. But um, both the Houston Ballet Company and we also did locally a behind the scenes with the Metropolitan Opera Company, their um, big cleaning secret is vodka. Uh, they use it, you can use it in a misting, if you have a steamer mister, you do it 50% vodka, 50% water. If you buy a spray mister, you use 100% vodka. You want to look for, you don't want to have to buy the best, most expensive vodka, but you want to look for a vodka that's hopefully more than 40% alcohol. An 80 proof vodka is 40%, but the higher alcohol you get, the more bacteria it will get rid of. And what it will do is get rid of the, the musty smell or if it's a costume that a lot of different people have worn, you spray it with the vodka and you leave it out to, to dry and air and, and that'll work you know, really well. Because uh, generally you don't wanna be doing a lot of washing of any kind of costume. You can also use the in dryer, dry cleaning um, products that you buy at the store, you buy them in the grocery store. They work fine. They don't work so great if it's heavily soiled. Uh, heavily soiled something, you'll either have to be willing to wash it or take it to a, a regular dry cleaner to get rid of. But that's that's how you take care of it. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so at least we can have vodka if we need to, to clean our costumes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. That's good, thank you. I'm, I'm just gonna go. I know uh, some information has been answered by our by Sarah uh, to our um, audience, but I just want to go back to some people that said, here is Frances Shakib. She said, thank you really. And she learned a lot. Um, and um, also Bernie has said, thanks to all for a wonderful presentation on fabrics, very helpful. And let's see, and also Frances Sh Shakib, also said any suggestions for cleaning white canvas sneakers? I can, I can address that actually. Um, so of course you have to be careful. Some sneakers will be washable and some will, you know, some you could throw in the washing machine depending upon what they say. And some you can't, like you could throw kids in the washing machine. 
Okay, but if you can't put it in the washing machine, canvas can be wet. So the two products that I've always used on canvas, white canvas sneakers is Tylex and soft scrub. You take a little soft scrub on a toothbrush and you scrub it into the sneaker. Okay, and then you kind of, now I have to warn you that if it gets on the inner sole of the sneaker, it will discolor the inner sole, but nobody sees that after you, when you have your foot in it anyway. So, and then you scrub it in, let it sit for a minute or so, and then rinse off the top. If it's not really a washable sneaker, you want to avoid getting it on the bottom, but just rinse off the canvas, stuff it with some paper towels and let it dry. And it, it, it really works wonders. I've been using Tylex and soft scrub on white clothing for a very long time. <laughs> That's good to know, <laughs> so we could clean our sneakers. So very <laughs> good, very good. Um, okay, I also have here uh, another question. Um, what causes fabric moths? What is the best way to rid clothing, clothing of moths and how to prevent? Um, and she also says, very informative presentation. Thank you. Um, I could sort of address this. Um, and I might digress a little bit about it, but you need to put things away clean. Um, you need to clean all your sweaters before you put them away for the summer. You need to make sure that anything is clean because any food residue in it um, will attract any kind of insects. The other thing that often happens if you don't have something, if you've ever pulled something out to wear in September that you put away and it's got yellow stains on it, it's because the garment has not been cleaned and it oxidizes during the storage period. And once those stains are in there, they're really hard to get out. So the, the best, the, I, you know, I'm um, not a real expert on moths, but I haven't had them in quite a while. And that's because I'm really diligent about washing things before I put them away. Um, some of them go in, um, I put them in bins. Um, those big plastic bins and I stick a couple of cedar chips or, you know, that you buy in there and that will, that will keep it. Once they've started to eat, I mean, it, it, you know, they've had a field day and you've given them lunch and you have to say goodbye to, to that garment. So I hope that helps. Right. I also just want to emphasize what Anne Marie said about the plastic bins. You don't want to store clothing like wool in a fabric bin. You know, some people under the um, under the bed, they make fabric boxes because the moths that eat through your clothes can also eat through the fabric box. You want it to be in one of those um, giant vinyl bags or a plastic bin after you've cleaned it. Okay, but putting it away clean is really very important. So the key is putting things clean, Keep everything clean to all its stage and even clean the bin too, right? <laughs> Don't have the bin dirty. <laughs> um, okay, I have another question here from Francis Shakib. How should one correctly dispose of worn out denim blue jeans? Well, you okay, cut them so apart and make something wonderful out of them. We've yeah. got a couple of members who- Well, that's, who what, that's what we would do. <laughs> yeah, that's what we would do. They do repurpose clothing and they've made, um, stuffed animals out of them. They put pieces together to make jackets. You can do, you do a search on Pinterest, you'll find, you know, all sorts of, of ideas because other than that, you know, you, you would dispose of them the way you would any worn out fabric, which is, um, I, I bundle mine all up and, and, and mark them as rags and put them in uh, those collection bins for used clothing. And a lot of those organizations then sell them and the, fib the fibers are broken down and, and used other ways. Um, but I did want to just say something about, about denim while we're talking about it, because I know there's a big um, push for, you know, torn and ripped and, and tattered looking jeans and buying them new. And if sustainability is, and the environment is a concern of yours, it, it's a good idea to stay away from that stuff, because the, the amount of chemical processes that have been used to create that worn look are really terrible for the environment. Um, it's, you know, if you want worn blue jeans, then wear them out. <laughs> <laughs> create your own by wearing them a lot, but don't, but don't stay away from them in the, in the, in the fashion stores. Um, also on that note about the recycling of denim. So it's very hard to dispose of textiles. 
Um, I look for places all the time, but there are places that will accept them. If you Google that, you know, where can I make textile donations? There is a store called Madewell, which is a jeans company. And if you bring an old pair of jeans, no matter what the condition of the jeans, they will give you $20 off a pair of new jeans because they take your old denim and they will recycle it and they make housing insulation out of it. Okay. Oddly enough, I once tried to bring them yards and yards and yards of denim to donate towards their insulation project and they wouldn't take it. <laughs> they would only take it if it was already made into jeans. Okay. So, you know, consider that there may be people who like your worn out jeans and they could go to the Salvation Army or the Goodwill and find a second life. Or also you could call your township because some of the townships, you know, not only recycle glass and plastic, but some of them recycle textiles. So that might help. Okay, and I just I want to ask here, uh, actually, I have a, a, a comment here. Clifton Recycling Center used to have bins for fabric, and uh, they're, uh, they're saying, um, hope that they bring them back. I think they will. Um, you know, I, I know the recycling center here is going through some transformations, but um, like Sarah just said, there are some also other places too, besides the municipalities that might have that. You know, I just wanted to ask also, um, if I can, I know you mentioned um, Anne-Marie in um, the new, which probably might happen in the later on in this decade, with the bananas and the mushrooms, not realizing these kinds of ingredients that we can eat. Um, but this becomes really, I guess right now it's rare. Uh, are there some places that we could, not actual stores, but maybe online that we could look them up? They're that? not, they're not, um, no, at the moment, no, they're not really available to the consumer because they're, they're produced in such small, quantities um and actually banana fabric is isn't new it's been around a long time um not necessarily here in the states and um and interestingly and i didn't go into it but if you google it there's also you can make fabric out of oranges okay. and you can make fabric out of grapes and um, yeah if anybody is interested in those if you go on the um asg.org their national site and click on their blog. Um, one of our gals did a whole series and we use some of the information from what she did for today on different kinds of fibers and their sources. And you can learn there a little bit more about the, the um, grape fabric and the orange fabrics. And then if you get hungry, you just eat your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> That's an expensive meal. <laughs> Well, it's definitely in a, it's an own way of recycling. You get to eat and you get to also create your own coverings. So um, that's really good to know. Um, okay, I, I just want to reach out again to our audience uh, attendees. If you still have any questions or comments, you still have a few seconds more to add any, anything if you'd like. Um, but this has really been wonderful to, to know, um, especially now in this time and, and the decades where we're in, understanding fabrics and how it can be relating to our life, just even if you don't sew, but you want to be a good shopper and know what type of material to, to that would be the best, not just on how you look, but um, for the environment is great to know. And, and this has been really wonderful in, in helping us. And Roxanne, I would like to just add, if anybody wants to buy some beautiful cottons, can I recommend a few places? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we have Acme Country Fabrics in um, Pequannock and Fabric Land in Greenbrook, New Jersey, and Cultured Expressions in Rahway, and Stony Brook Sew and Vac in Bordentown, New Jersey. Those four places have beautiful cotton fabrics and other fabrics too. Fabric Land has dress fabrics and home decor fabrics. So if anybody's looking for local places to buy fabric. I know there's not a lot of fabric stores like there used to be, 
but these four are still out there and we recommend them. Yeah. Can I also add above and beyond in Nanuet? Oh, um, yes. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. These, thank these, you. These, this little group has been great friends to, to ASG. You know, there's other wonderful fabric stores around, but they've been particularly um, supportive and helpful to us. And we like to return the favor because they are wonderful retailers. So. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to say something about where our membership comes from? Oh, anywhere in the universe, <laughs> any planet. Uh, no, so technically you don't have to live in North Jersey to become a member of our chapter. We have members in North Jersey, of course, but we also have members from New York, Delaware, Pennsylvania. We had Arizona. So because we're doing so much virtual, um, you, you could live anywhere. And um, if you're a beginner, also, that might be a great thing for you to join our group because we just started a new beginner group to help beginners. On Zoom. On Zoom. Beginners on Zoom. Yes. And That's Sarah is their wonderful leader. So you, you get real good information. Thank you. Yes, we're having a good time. We're learning how to sew. That's great. See, it's in a, in a modern way through through zoom so zoom and, so, and sewing yeah and even even when the when the pandemic is over we you know we have that monthly thing called the sew and we're going to continue to do that on zoom and then we're exploring ways to make our uh meetings hybrid so that people can join in no matter where they are if they don't feel like driving whatever i do see some more information here. Here, here is a, a question from Bernice Kennedy. Um, can you include the names of the fabric stores so we can write them down? Um, thanks much. Yes. I guess we can get me gets a chance to visit the website of the American Sewing Guild North Jersey chapter, but this has been wonderful. I do thank our attendees, our audience for, for um, being here with us, but also thank you to our panelists, uh, Sarah Nunziata and Laura Adler and Anne-Marie Soto for all this detailed information about fabrics that we now have a better understanding and appreciation. So I do wanna say to everyone, thank you again Without further ado, all the very best to everyone. And let's keep thank on you. wearing thank our you. fabrics and understanding. And thank them. you, Roxanne, for inviting us. Yes, thank it was you. lovely. Yeah, thank you. It was our pleasure. Thank you. Take good care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.